you have your Bibles, and I hope you do. If not, if it's on your phone, you should have a Bible app for you young ones. <laughs> Please turn to the book of Galatians. Yeah, Bible app, man. I have that, and I'm not even hip. Um, yeah, we are going to study through Galatians. And I, and I, want, I don't want you to worry too much. I don't, we're not going to get so bogged down in the book. I mean, I know sometimes people get, oh, we're going to go through an entire book. It's going to be you know, two years before we're done. That's not going to happen. My wife just looked at me like, yeah, right. No, no, it's not. Um, we want to go through this, take, take nice chunks. But I, want, I think it's good sometimes, especially with the smaller, shorter letters, like Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, they're not that long. So what I want you to do, would be really cool for you to do, is kind of just read it, man. Like through the week, once a week. It's just six chapters. Boom, you could read it in 15 minutes. You know what I mean? It's true. And also place yourself in that context. Like as Paul's writing to, to these Christians, a lot of the stuff, much of it applies to us today. So kind of I like to sometimes just put myself in that place. Like, I'm a member of this congregation, or you know, one of these congregations that he's writing to. You know what I mean? And, and, and take it as if Paul's writing. What's he saying? What's he trying to exhort? What's he teaching us? I think it'll be helpful in that way. So it's not so wooden, you know, so stale. But uh, So we're going to try to go through in a decent time period, not get too bogged down. Read it, man. You could read it once a week. It's, it's easy to go, go through these letters and, and, and study, think about things. And then... Um, also, kind of put yourself in that place, you know, as, as if we're part of that congregation, because in some sense, we are. Okay. Um, I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. Um, as I do that, or right before I do, do that, I'm just going to give you a, a brief outline of, of kind of the book of what we're going to hit on as we, as we go through this letter. The first thing we're going to talk about today is the purity of the gospel, the purity and the power of the gospel. That's everything for us, guys. It is the power and the purity of the message of salvation. That's the hope that we have. We're going to talk about that today. Um, next week, we're going to look at the, the transforming power of the gospel, how it changes us. We're going to talk about Paul, because one of the issues that they had in, in these congregations where false teachers were coming in, they were kind of getting on Paul and saying, well, we don't know. The, other, you know, the others, yeah, they have that authority. But Paul, they kind of questioned his authority a little bit. And, and he deals with that, and we'll see the, the, the transforming power of, of the gospel. And then just the essence of the gospel, guys, and, and especially in chapters, um, end of chapter 2, verse chapter 3 and 4, just what it means to be saved and what salvation is. And that's Paul's big point in this, because people were adding to the gospel. They were saying, okay, you can believe, but, and, you know, something else. No, there's nothing else. And that's Paul's main driving point. That's, that's the, the essence of the gospel. That's our justification, that we're accepted by God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Again, that's the heart of the Reformation, too. That's really uh, impacted Martin Luther and then other reformers as well. And then finally, the implications of the gospel, of the gospel you know, what, what it means, especially chapters 5 and 6, what it means, what's it look like? Okay, we have it, we have an understanding of it, this is what the essence is of it, this is the power. But what's it look like in my life, man? If my life's not changed, you know, then am I truly converted? So chapters 5 and 6 especially talks about the implications um, of the gospel and what it looks like in our lives. So that's just a broad outline of, of the book. Um, again, the, the, the issues, <clears throat> questioning of Paul's authority, and how we're made right before God in his sight. So, here we go. The purity of the gospel. Verses 1 through 10. Paul writes, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in grace, in the grace of Christ, and turning to a different gospel. Not that there's another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. 
But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of God. Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this precious word. And and just pray that that your spirit would give us understanding, that we would be fully engaged, Lord, this morning with you and with your precious word by your spirit, that um, you would teach us as, as we look to you. I pray that you would be with me, Lord, to bring your message forth, to give me uh, the words to speak that honor and glorify you and build up um, this, this, this people, our congregation. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, man, this is so, this is really, it's just a cool letter. This letter is just filled with urgency. Do you ever feel really urgent about something? Like you can't wait to see that person or talk to them because you really have to tell them something. They need to know um, what's on your heart. You, you need to communicate to them. That's what this letter, that's how this starts off. It is just filled with urgency from Paul. It's filled with some frustration, right, as the pastor of these congregations. By the way, they're Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. That's where these congregations were located. So they would get the letter, and one congregation would read it, and they would pass it on to others to, to read the letter. That's how it went. But you see that the urgency, the frustration, and just deep concern. This is so cool because this is the heart of a pastor, man. This is the heart of a pastor who loves his congregation, his people, the people of God, enough to confront them. That's what this is. And, and that's what he loves so much about Paul. That's why in verse 10 he says, look, am I seeking the approval of man? Am I trying to please you guys so you'll like me? That's a tendency for so many of us because we want to be liked, all of us. And pastors, aren't, you know, we're not excluded from that. So a lot of times we'll, we'll hold back from saying what we say. We won't risk the relationship because, you know, we don't want you to go or we don't want you to. See, Paul's not doing that. The gospel means too much to him. And Christ means too much to him. And the people mean too much to him for him to back off in any way, right? So, so he's, he, he loves them enough to confront them and to challenge them, even to rebuke them. Because, because if you get the gospel wrong, then everything is wrong. Then, then you don't have Christ, and you really have nothing. So that's the the um, urgency. That's 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 what he felt. That's what he's, he cu- he couldn't wait to write this. He kind of gets right into it because the integrity of the gospel is at stake. And for us guys, the gospel is everything, isn't it? It has to be. Everything begins with the gospel. So the urgency is seen in the way he begins the letter. He has a nice little salutation, a little introduction, but then he goes right into the problem by, by verse 6. You know, he says, I'm astonished. You know, so, so it's a, it's a, it's a brief introduction, and then he just gets right into the issue. That's not Paul's style, really, because in other letters, if you want to turn, turn to Philippians. Just turn a few pages. We won't do Ephesians because it's a little bit different. But check it out. When he opens the letter to Philippians... Right? Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to the saints who are at Philippi with the overseas and deacons, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he has a whole few paragraphs here of just thanksgiving and prayer. Like he's, hey man, I thank God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, making prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. And I'm sure he who began a good work in you will complete until the day of Christ Jesus. So it's nice and flowery and he's loving on that congregation. And that's good. Same with Colossians. Just turn the page, you'll be at Colossians. Um, again, the little introduction and then the things. We always thank God, the, our, the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, as we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ, your love for all the saints, because of the, the hope that's laid up for you in heaven, of this we've heard before the word of, you've heard the word of truth, which has come to you, you indeed are bearing fruit. You know, it's nice, these congregations are deep, but check out Galatians, right? When he's right into these congregations, it's a lot different. He gives his introduction, and then he just starts and says this, and now we see his frustration in the statement of astonishment. Okay, he, he, he greets them and says, okay, we're saved by Christ, amen. 
But then he gets right into it. He starts with a brief, I'm astonished in verse 6 that you are so quickly deserting him who called you to the grace of Christ and you're turning to a different gospel. Not that there's another gospel. Do you see that? Do you see the difference? Do you see the urgency? Do you see that he really wants to get this message across? He wants them to listen because of what's at stake. He says, I'm fr- you could sense his frustration. Right? I'm, I'm astonished. I can't believe it. The midzdo is the word in Greek. It's a real strong word, and it means astonishment, right? It means bewildered. I, I he's genuinely shocked that these guys have the gospel, and all of a sudden they're, they're, it's being changed. They're turning to a different one. So he's shocked. He's stunned. He's surprised by the fact that they're so quickly turning away from the truth of the gospel that they had received. See, that's a danger for us as Christians. That's why you need. We need strong teaching. That's why you need to be reminded over and over again of the gospel because our tendency is to get away from it, to add to it, take away from it. So Paul, you could read about in Acts 13 to 16 how the churches were planted, how they came together, but he's reminding them of the gospel. That we're sinners. Christ lived for us. He died. He was raised on the third day. By his grace, we repent, we receive, we believe on him, and we rest in him. The problem was in this congregation, and it's an issue for us today. We'll get to that because it's relevant for us as well. The problem, the issue, uh, where people were coming into the church, they were called the Judaizers. They were Jewish background, and they said, in addition to faith, yes, believe in Jesus. That's cool. You need to believe in him for salvation. But also, in addition to that, you need one more little thing, and that's just, hey, God, you just need to be circumcised as well and kind of follow the rules and the rituals of, of Judaism a little bit, and, and that will really fill out your salvation. Then you'll really be accepted uh, by God. You'll be, accept- you'll be right with him. So, yeah, believe in him, right? But also, you need to do this one little thing. You need to, you're adding something to it. And you know what, guys? That, that's appealing to us. We like adding, right? We like doing. We just do, right? That, that's, how, that's how things work. When we have to do something, that appeals towards our tendency of earning it, right? Of meriting it. And that's just the way we operate. That's the way we function. That's the way we love to live. That's the way we live our lives, right? That's the way the world works. We earn things, man. We merit them, whatever it is. If you're a kid in school, you work hard to get good grades, right? And and, and in regards to relationship, you know, I I try to win your respect. I try to earn your respect by doing the right things. We earn money by by working hard. We merit it. It's ours. It's something that I do, okay? It's owed to me because I did it, because I worked for it, for a reputation. You want to earn a good reputation, Right, so you want to do the right thing so people say nice things about you and respect you. So, so we're just, we're used to earning. We're, we're used to doing in order to be accepted, in order to have. That's a big deal for us. That's, that's really what it's about. So it's natural to us. Now here comes the gospel. Here comes Christianity. And just, it blows all that away. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't earn, we shouldn't work hard, and in some respects, you know, this, this is good. But when it comes to Christianity, when Christianity requires this, requires you to do something in order to be fully accepted by God or to earn his favor in some way, then you don't have Christianity at all. See, that's a contra- it goes against our natural instincts. It goes against the way of the world. It goes against, you know, the way things are. I earn it. I do it. I get it, man. That's why I have, because I do. Christianity says, no, 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 no. Do you see that, man? That's, the, that's the, the paradox of Christianity, the depth of it, that it's all of grace. It's a gift. We have to understand that. We have to get that. We can't add to it, because once you do that, if you say, believe in Jesus and whatever else, then you have no gospel at all. There's no salvation in that. There's only one gospel. Paul says, you're coming with another gospel when you do that. Not that there is another gospel, because there isn't. He's, he's not saying, look, you could have this gospel and another gospel and that. No, 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 no. This is the only one. This is the truth. If you add to it, look, even if you take away from it, if you distort it in any way, it's no longer the gospel. You've lost it. I'm going to try a cheesy illustration. I, I'm not good with illustrations, guys. But let's try this in terms of the gospel. Think of the Mona Lisa. 
Da Vinci. That's perfection as far as we can perfectly go, right? It's great. That's the Mona Lisa. We know that. Just picture that. I, I should have had a slide for it. You could see it. But you can picture it in your mind. And there it is. Perfect picture. Best you could have. But what if you come up to and say, look, it's, it's not. Yeah, it's Da Vinci. <laughs> what if you say, well, yeah, it looks really good and all. But you know, it's missing something. She needs like a beauty mark right here. So, you know, so I'm just going to add that to the painting, a nice beauty mark. And yes, that's it. No. And when you do that, then it's not, it's not the original. It's not authentic anymore. That's what it's like with the gospel. Was that good? Do you guys get that? Did you get the picture? Yeah. Okay. That's the idea here. So they're adding to it. So it's not the Mona Lisa anymore. Well, it is as elements, but it's not the authentic original. When we distort the message, listen, and this is really important. Why is it so important? Why is Paul laboring this? Why is Paul really frustrated? You know, he's kind of ticked at these people saying, how could you do this right away? Because when we do that, when we distort the message of the gospel, you know what you're really doing? You're taking away from the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, right? From everything that he has paid it all, that he has done it all. And you're saying, no, 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 no. You've done most of it, Jesus but just let me do a little bit more so you accept me. So we take away from the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ, and we rob him of that glory that's due his name alone. You understand? That's why Paul's upset, because that's what they're doing. I'm doing a little bit here. All you need to do is this. Believe plus. Okay? No. No. It's just believe Christ has done it all. When we do something to add to it, or work, or try to please him through our works, not because we're saved, but in order to be saved, and that detracts from his glory. And that also gives you a reason to boast, and that gets right back to our pride, because we love to boast, because we love to say, yes, I've done something. Yes, I've made that decision. Yes, I went through with this ritual. Yes, I've done that too. See, we love that because that's our sinful nature, and we love to have that credit. When it comes to the gospel and Christianity, we can take nothing. There's not one scintilla of credit that we can take before the Lord when it comes to salvation. That's why Paul's urgent. That's why he's, he says, look, if you do that, then, you're then there's really no gospel at all, and nobody's gonna, you're not going to profit from that, okay? Because that, that's not the message of, of, the, of, of the truth of the gospel. So modern-day examples. They're, they're, we could fall into that tendency to do something in order to have God accept us or think that, you know, hope that if we do this, that just kind of assures us of that salvation on different levels. But even within denominations and churches, you have this idea. Okay, so we'll do one Protestant, one Catholic. Protestant denomination, and I'm telling you this as a pastor. I don't want to know oh, you're cutting down. I'm not cutting down. As a pastor, I have a duty, too, to, to, to teach you, to, to show you, to warn you, because there's all kinds of false teaching out there, for sure. So if you drive by down the street and you see Christian church or disciples of Christ or first Christian church, oh, Christian church, right? You know what they teach about salvation? Exactly what Paul's talking about here, speaking against it. It says this, you hear the gospel, you decide, right, to believe in Jesus, you invite him into your heart, he comes into your heart, good, and then you go and you're baptized and then you're saved. That completes the salvation process. So you have to do that. You have to not only believe, okay? You call him into your heart. You say yes to Jesus. And that's good. But if you died, apart from being baptized, you will not go to heaven. That's the teaching. That's the idea here. So in other words, you need to go and be baptized as well. And that completes your salvation. That's not, that's exactly what Paul's talking against. You're adding to the work of Christ. Okay? The sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Second example, many of us were raised in Roman Catholic Church. This is what Martin Luther really fought against and came against and, you know, discovered through Galatians. You're born, you're baptized, God's grace is infused into you. The work of Christ is conferred upon you through baptism. It's effectual. That makes a change. It makes an actual change in your soul, in your spirit, okay? But then you spend the rest of your life doing, okay? You spend the rest of your life 
completing or saying, look, God, here's what I'm doing. So yes, I'm going to go to church every Sunday. So yes, I'm going to go to First Holy Communion. So yes, I'm going to go to confirmation. So yes, I'm going to, going to go to confession. So yes, I'm going to do penance. So yes, I'm going to do good works. You see that? That's what goes, and that's that treadmill that you're on. And you're kind of saying, okay, it's here. Believe. Yeah. But here's what I have to do in order to be truly saved, in order to be accepted by Him, in order to be justified, right? In order to be, um, in order to come into His presence. These are the things I need to do. No, Paul speaking against that. That's, that's why this is so important for us. That's why Galatians speaks to this. That's the purity of the gospel. Once you add anything to it, then you don't have the gospel at all. Right? And I know that's hard to grasp because our tendency is towards doing something. I gotta do something. No, nothing. Christ has done it all. Psalm 130. We read from it this morning, but it says this. Did I give you Psalm 130? Okay. Am I way down the list? (laughs) Psalm 130. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? The answer to that question is what? No one. Does the Lord mark iniquities? Yes, he does. We sin against him. And so he's saying this from a perspective of a person who's been justified. If you should mark iniquities, who could stand? No one could stand. But with you there's forgiveness that you may be feared. And then in Psalm 32, 2 says this, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. So blessed is that person whom the Lord doesn't count their sins against them. How does that happen? That's the whole idea of Galatians. By the righteousness of Christ, who is justification. So, um, 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us this, for our sake, and I know this is up here all the time, but I want you guys to have this. This is, this is so important to our understanding of free grace and being justified freely before God, being acceptable, being able to come into the sight of holy God. Okay? Because he made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to become sin for us, for his people for those who would believe in him. So Jesus takes all of our sin on himself. Understand? He becomes sin for us. And he pays for that. He propitiates. He satisfies the wrath of God that's due us because of sin. All of that is on Christ, laid on him. All your sins, right? Past, present, future. That's why you don't have to look back in the past and say, oh, shucks, you know, I'm still... Yeah, we can look back with some regret and all that, but you don't live in the guilt and bondage of those past sins because they've been forgiven. And when you rest on the, like if you go back and you keep thinking that up, think, again, you're taking away from the sufficiency of Christ. He's dealt with that. So don't you continually go back there. Your sins are forgiven, past. That's so why you don't have to live back there, right? Present and future. Our sins are laid upon him. <coughs> He made him who knew no sin to become sin so that in him, as we trust in him, we might become the righteousness of Christ. This is what Martin Luther called the great exchange. Okay, All of our sins to Christ, and that's cool and that's great. He pays for them. Good. But guess what? In addition to that, he gives us all of his righteousness. So the perfect finished work of Christ is imputed or given to us, stamped to our account. Isn't that amazing? That's great. That's, that's why we rejoice. That's why we can't do anything to earn. We don't deserve this in any way. We can't make God do this. This is by grace. So all of our sins are given to Christ, his righteousness to us. That's how we can stand before a holy God. That's why we are considered just. Right? We're still sinners, yet considered just because of the work of Christ. So when he looks at you, he doesn't see, oh, your sinfulness. He sees the righteousness of his precious son on us. Amen. Praise God. That's justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. That's what this is all about. That's how it's always been, too. Don't think it just started in the New Testament. It's always been this way. We can never add to our salvation. We can never make God love us or do something that he would give us favor in that way by meriting it. So we have to get that out of our mindset because in other parts of life, yes, we do. We earn. You know, we have to hope people will love us for the things we do. It's not like that with the Lord. This is the free gift of grace. And that's what Paul is talking about here in Galatians. So it goes all the way back. 
it goes all the way back to the garden. After Adam and Eve fell, what did God do? You guys know this. He pursued them. They weren't looking for him. They were hiding from him. So God pursues them, and then he provides a covering for them. That covering okay, is a, is a picture of what we're talking about this morning, that he covers their sins. He promises them a redeemer. That's the hope that we have in Christ. Right? The whole sacrificial system in Israel, as you read, as people brought their sacrifices daily to, to the temple, that was an atonement. That was a covering of sin. The sin was being um, given over to, to that sacrifice. It was paid for, and the people were declared righteous. That pointed to Christ's one-time sacrifice. That's what this is all about here. That's what he's talking about here. Christ's righteousness is our covering. And that's it. Nothing else. Nothing we do. Can't add to it. Can't take away from it. Because there's, there's, that, there's that part of when we add to it, man, but we also take away from it. How do we do that? We water down the message of the gospel. We try to make friends. We want everybody to like us, so we just tell them, oh, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, and, and he just wants you to, he's knocking at the door. He's not knocking anywhere. That's, that's way out of context. When he's talking about that, he's coming into judgment if the people don't change. That's the context of that passage in Revelation. It has nothing to do with God kind of knocking and hoping that you do. See, when we take away from the gospel, we also rob Christ of his sufficiency, right? Don't we? So don't be... Because you want people to like you. You don't want people to get mad at you. You want to make it nice and easy for people. Just make it what it is, man. Just tell them, look, here's who we are. This is what Christ has done. And, and let the chips fall because that's, that's what Paul says here. I'm not here to please you. I'm not here to try to make friends. I don't, I, mean, I don't want you to hate me, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to water down. I'm not going to add to so that you'll like me because it's not about me. It's about Christ Jesus, and it's about you. So his righteousness is our covering. Right? That, that act of God's grace where our sins are pardoned, where we're accepted as righteous in his sight because of the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. That's what Paul is getting at here. When Jesus said to Telestai on the cross, when he said it is finished, it was finished. Okay? It is paid for. That's it. We can't do anything more. Okay? We, we can't say yes plus. Yes, and I'll do this. Yes, and I hope... No. no. Now, as Christians, once we're saved, for sure, we're going to do what we're doing because we're saved, not in order to be saved or loved by the Lord. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. You can't get to the place where you somehow deserve it. You can't make it happen by trying to be good, by doing better, by working harder, by going through rituals, by obeying the laws. No, you can't because he already has. Capish? That's it. That's Paul's point. There's no other gospel. There's no other way of salvation. You cannot mess with perfection. See, we try to do that all the time, but we can't do it. This is the purity of the gospel. That's it. That's what Paul's talking about here. It's just kind of an introduction today. This is not a long message. I'm just telling you right now, this is what Paul's saying. Is that if there's anything preached contrary to what I'm teaching you, that's not the gospel at all. So you there's implications for us. First of all, when we talk to people about Christ Jesus, we have to tell them straight up what it is. See, a lot of times we like to, to either add or take away, like I just said, okay? But we have to give the full orb gospel as God gives us opportunity. And I want us to be a gospel preaching church. I don't want you to be afraid to tell people about Christ. I want you, as God gives you opportunity, whoever you're talking to, your neighbor, your friend, your coworker, stranger, whoever it is, as the Lord gives you opportunity to tell them, to preach the gospel to them. That's what this is all about. That's what Paul's saying. What's the message? It's not hard. That we're sinners, man. That's it. You have to start with that. We're not just, you know, people that make mistakes. <laughs> okay, right. No, we are sinners. And we are lost. And don't be afraid to say that. See, Paul's not afraid. We are sinners who are lost, and we deserve God's wrath, and we deserve hell. Yeah, we do, man. That's, and I know that's hard to say because we live, especially in our culture, wow, you know, people get really freaked out about that. But that's the truth. And if you don't talk about that, then nothing else really matters too much. If you're just okay, then okay. You know, we're not that bad. Well, okay. No, we're as bad as it gets. We're enemies of God, spiritually speaking. We're lost sinners on our way to hell, right? That's it. That's the main message, of, a big point of the gospel, that we can't exclude, we can't water down, we can't change. 
that Christ lived a life that we could never live. He lived a perfect, sinless life for sinners like us. That he died to death that we deserve. Right? He substituted himself on the cross in our place for sins. He took our punishment. The punishment we deserve for sins. He died. Yeah, he died. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. Bodily resurrection of Christ. Okay? And there's no other way. If by grace you believe, you repent, you receive, you rest on him, your sins are forgiven, you have a place with him in heaven. That's it. That's not hard. That's the, that's the message of the gospel. Make sure you say by grace, <laughs> if you believe, because it is by grace that we simply receive. Okay? We repent of our sins. That's a big deal too. We don't want to talk about repentance because we don't want people to really feel that they're that bad, know you're that bad, that you need to repent of your sin. And that's a godly sorrow that you have sinned against holy God. Okay? And you own that sin. There's nothing else. It's like the thief on the cross. What else did he have to do on that day in order to be saved? Did he have to add to that? No. No. He was convicted. Grace came upon him at that moment. And he said to the other thief, Hey, mister, we were wrong in what we did. We deserve what we're getting. Okay? We deserve it. Jesus, please remember we, me when you come into your kingdom. What did Jesus say to him? Today you'll be with me in paradise. What did he have to do? Did he have to be circumcised? Did he have to be baptized? Did he have to go through this, all those rituals in order to be saved? 